I think, I guess as a colleague before me said, uh, you'll find this presentation slightly different from the rest. However, talking during the coffee with another colleague, I realized apparently this session is quite um, varied, across different type of presentation. Um, this topic, I mean, my background, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, a, not an archaeologist, I'm not a geologist, um, I'm not a, a geology. My background is in construction. So please, be, be kind with me. <laughs> um, the topic of this presentation actually is related to the radiocarbon dating of flying workers, which is actually construction, if you want. Um, however, it's strictly related to archaeology. And it's a bit more theoretical rather than practical. There are some practical applications, but the point of this presentation is more um, related to the theoretical concept of where we are going now about this. And actually, is, in my opinion, um, I'd like to discuss with you the need of having double level validations of the results we get from the AMS laboratories. Um, I have no idea if you are aware of the fact that it's possible to use the carbon dating method for dating uh, lime mortars. Now, I'm not going to go through how the carbon method works because I think you know, but I include in my presentation some slides about the basic principle why we can use the carbon dating method with lime mortars. If you find this part boring, let me know. I'll skip and go over, over mm -hmm. to the next step. There'll be some examples, then we get big questions that I'd like to rise in this presentation, and then the conclusions. Um, just as a basic principle, for those of you who are not maybe fully aware of the fact that actually the radiocarbon method can be applied to lime mortars, I'd like to point out the fact actually the first time that someone suggested the possibility of using the method for dating lime mortars dates back to 1964 in a paper published in the journal Nature. And the paper was written by a couple of French researchers. The paper is this actually, this one. This is it. It's a very short paper, just a column. And there is a sort of a, a, sort of a, a methodological section, experimental section, and then conclusion. And that's it. The methodological section, from my <coughs> perspective, it's very simple. But it's too simple. So probably to explain why it's possible to use the carbon dating method with lime mortars, let me just introduce this slide. What the two researchers said in 1964 is when lime, and lime is calcium hydroxide in construction, not in chemistry, um, is mixed to, with sand to be used then in a wall, for building a wall, immediately, as soon as calcium hydroxide is hydrated, it reacts with the CO2 contained in the atmosphere. Okay? And this reaction in construction is quite common, it's very well known, it's called carbonation. The thing is, if you see this equation, basically the CO2 which was in the atmosphere is then fixed in, in a mineral with a quite low solubility. Usually, this mineral is calcite. The thing is, because the, cal the, the carbon is fixed in calcite, and because in the atmosphere there was were different um, carbon isotopes, in this mineral there is also the same amount of radiocarbon that was in the atmosphere. But because it's fixed in a mineral, it decays over time and it's not replaced. As it happens in orga living organisms, when they reach the, the end, it decays. So theoretically, you'd actually extract the carbon from the calcium carbonate, from the calcite, and analyze the amount of radiocarbon, and using this amount to date the time of the setting of the line. Which for an archaeologist is great because actually it gives us the time when the mortar became hard, was actually the construction time. Right, easy peasy, right? <laughs> can we actually extract the CO2 from, I mean, the carbon from lime mortar? Yes, we can. There are a couple of techniques we can use. One is by acid dissolution, and one is by uh, thermal decomposition. Uh, in this case, the acid dissolution is actually uh, described the uh, hydrochloric acid, or, or also uh, portophosphoric acid can be used. The thing is, in both cases, uh, we extract the carbon as a CO2, which is a gas. And it's easy to separate the gas from the rest 
of the phases, solid and liquid phases, can be captured in a vial. And then what's in a vial can be sent to the AMS laboratory for being transformed in graphite and then used as a target for the uh, mass spectrometer. Theoretically, it's great. It's perfect. However, as the two French researchers said at the end of their paper, it's a tiny bit of problem. They said if calcareous sand are used, then we've got a problem because there is another source of carbon in the mortar. And we don't like this source of carbon. What this researcher said is sometimes is used, this type of aggregate. I think sometimes is a quite generous um, description. Quite often is actually limestone sand. And therefore, quite often, we've got a problem of contaminant in the lime mode. So over the last 25 years, a group of researchers, they spend their time in finding a way of separating the CO2 produced by the decomposition of the um, dissolution of the carbonated lime from the CO2 produced by the decomposition or dissolution of limestone sand. And this is because basically, even if today is a, almost 2018, we have no method, no method for separating the aggregate from the binder when, by binder when we got a lump of lime mold. Believe it or not, this is a composite material. When it's made and lime hardened, this is it. We can't go back to the raw material. To make things worse, actually, we need to consider that within the lime mortars, there are several sources of carb um, carbon dioxide or carbon. And these sources can be grouped actually in three groups. Only one group is actually good for us. There are two groups are bad. We, I mean, we must avoid this. And the good, so, I mean, the good source is just a carbonated line. That's it. Among the bad sources, we've got two different groups because sources in this group they tend to provide a date which is more recent <coughs> than the real date of the setting time of the motor. Whereas sources in this group, they tend to provide us an age which is older than the real time. And we have no control on how much CO2 produced by the decomposition or uh, acid dissociation from these sources get mixed with this, or from this mixed with this. We have no control at all. That's why research was needed. So over the past 25 years, a number of researchers around the world, well, mostly in Europe, they developed techniques for separating the CO2 produced by the decomposition of carbonated lime from the rest of the CO2. These two methods are based on a very simple principle. Calcium carbonate of geological origin tend to react slowly compared to the calcium carbonate that produced by the carbonation of lime. And this can be either if the calcium carbonate is decomposed, in the sense that if a, calcium, if a piece of mortar is decomposed, the calcium carbonate, which was actually carbonated lime, tend to decompose at a lower temperature, 700 degrees Celsius, compared to the decomposition temperature of the limestone sand. In this case, the acid dissolution means that when we put some acid on the top of a piece of mortar, the first reaction, the first gas produces, is actually because of the dissolution of the carbonated lime and not uh, the, ca the calcium carbon contained in the, in the sand. So these are two methods could be used. This method has a quite long history. A good description of how it works is actually in this paper. This method here was used in the paper in Nature in 1965, has been abandoned for a while, but recently, in 2013, a group from uh, Ghent University tried to develop more, to, uh, to use more this method, so direct thermal decomposition and catching just the uh, CO2 produced at low temperatures. A group from Italy developed a method that actually is still based on acid dissolution, but before before um, dissolving the mortar in, in the acid, the mortar is pre-treated. And actually, a thermal shock, ultrasonic pass, so some of the mechanical and uh, physical characteristics of the mortar are used to separate just the binder from the aggregate. 
And then, more recently, <coughs> around 2006, 2007, several groups they came out with a, with a technique which is based on a completely different paradigm, which is actually the isolation of some of the unmixed lumps of lime that very often can be found in historic mortar to, to use in acidic solution for hydrocarbon dating of mortar. So we've got now a number of techniques that can be actually used successfully for the hydrocarbon dating of mortar. Just to give you an example of what kind of results you can get, uh, this is an um, ecological site where I actually worked um, back in probably 2012. And um, this is a case of a castle, a medieval castle, which was on the top of this hill near these uh, villages, in the same northwest of Italy. And this is an image of the archaeological site. And this is just a room that was excavated. In this room, we collected four samples of mortar. And these are actually something point of the mortars we collected. And we dated each sample using the lime lamp technique. The technique was up at the bottom of the slide, the previous slide. And uh, then we evaluated the results. So these are the results we got, the four lime lamps. You can see immediately, actually, <coughs> two lime lamps are exactly the same, basically. And this is very interesting. Um, let me give you a bit more information about this case. I decided to use this case as an example. First of all, because it's quite a small structure. The room was probably four or five meter uh, width and three meter wide. And um, the time when we know this castle was in use is quite limited, about 300 years. We know that the castle was mentioned the first time in 1173, and then was completely destroyed in 1477. And in this case also, we dated two samples from the, from samples from the foundation. And because it's quite limited structure, we assume that the results must have been exactly the same. Probably the foundation were from the same time. And then we dated two floors. One floor was on, on top of another, because there's been a lot of um, restoration works of these 300 years. So what we found basically is that the results of the two lamps that comes from the foundation are actually exactly the same. And this is great because it gives us confidence that using lime lamps it's possible to have consistent results. This is just an example. I could give you more examples like this. And what's even more interesting is that the two floor, these two, um, we have the stratigraphy, archaeological stratigraphy. We know one floor was more recent than the other one. The one on the top was built recently. And this sequence is actually represented by a small shift in the time of the two samples. So from our point of view, um, this uh, work was perfect, was great. It's within the 300 year we know the castle when it's in use and actually reflected everything we knew about the archaeological stratigraphy. That's great. However, this is the big question. How do we know that actually this result is correct? Because this could have been shifted a, bit, a little bit earlier or later, and we don't know this. We assume it's correct because we don't do carbon dating on two separate samples, but is there anywhere, is there any way we can use to validate actually these results without looking at the archaeological framework? This is the big question. Now, thanks to the work of some um, researchers from, from Finland and Denmark, we have actually a method for validating the results. And what these researchers have done for the last 20, 25 years is developing a method that allows us to understand if the calcium carbonate contained in the sample we date is good or bad. How do we do this? Basically, they said we can date several fractions of CO2 extracted from the same sample. Same sample, we extract several fractions of CO2. Uh, in this case, for instance, this line represents one sample, 
and these points represent five, uh, five um, CO2 fractions. And they call this line age profiles. What they said is if the first fraction provides an age which is similar to the second fraction, then we can assume that the calcium carbonate here was good, there was no contamination, and therefore we can use perhaps the first fraction to date uh, the stratigraphic unit. Great. Then they said, look, if we see a bump in the, in the age profile, we know that this bump is usually attributed to the contamination from uh, limestone sand. And therefore, in this case, we should date two samples from the same stratigraphic unit. And, uh, um, and then we compare the two profiles. If the two profiles are the same, we can use the first fraction of today the building. Basically, they came up with, um, with four criteria for using this fractionation method. It's great, absolutely great. I'm really happy we heard this. But is this good enough for us? It is what we need. Because there's something else we missed here. This fractionation method gives us information on the quality of the sample, or the calcium carbon contained in the sample. It doesn't tell us at all if the quality of the sampling work is correct or not. So technically, the carbon dating of the, of the sample could be correct, but maybe it doesn't fit inside the ecological framework because the sampling, wrong, uh, sampling work was wrong. Why sampling work, uh, work should be wrong? Because it how carbonation happen differently from, let's say, hydration in cement. It happened at the same time everywhere where the cement is casted. It's called bulk reaction. Carbonation is a surface reaction. It means that it starts from the surface. If we imagine this is just a particle of calcium hydroxide, it can be a single crystal, a lump of crystal, a lump of lime, which is in contact with air, the carbonation starts where air is in contact with the calcium hydroxide and then move toward the center. It means that the center carbonated later compared to the surface. Now, on a single crystal, maybe it's not a problem, but in a wall, which is several centimeters thick, this could be a problem. So this is an image of Adrian's wall, and this is sort of a cross-section <coughs> of the same wall. Um, if we assume we, we take two samples, one from the surface, one from the, from the core, from the core of the wall, <coughs> it would be quite easy to know, to understand, that these results would be different from this, even if the quality of the calcium carbon of the two samples is perfect. And that's because A reacts immediately with the CO2 atmosphere, so gives us the right time of the construction of the build, of the wall. Whereas this may take several weeks, months, or years. Just to give an example about how long it may take, there will be something in the center of the wall. There are reports in the scientific literature of Roman walls, two meters thick, where archaeologists still found calcium hydroxide in the core of the wall. It means if we take a sample from here, we get a result which is strong. Even if the quality of the calcium carbon is good, just because of how the carbonation reaction progresses. So, yes, and we don't have any sort of calibration curve for correcting this delay due to the depth of the sample. Right, you can say, okay, we're gonna get samples from the surface. The easiest thing to do. Yes, probably, it's easy. But let me show you this example. This is a facade of a medieval building, <coughs> which is uh, in Genoa, once again, northwest of Italy. It's been carefully analyzed by archaeologists because they wanted to know the age of the facade. Let me point your attention to the small pillar, which is here. It's about a meter 80 tall and 50 centimeters thick. Not a huge structure. In this small structure, we got five archaeometric dating. We got four lime lumps, data with a carbon dating method, and a brick data with thermal luminescence. And these are the results. These are actually the results of all the dating we've done. In the blue square are the results I've just mentioned. This is the result of thermal luminescence on a, on a piece of brick on that pillar. And these are the results of the carbon dating. As you can see, three lumps uh, from that pillar, they agree each other, okay? And they suggest the pillar was between the 1300 and 1400. <coughs> Sorry. 
and this is the same, is told to us by, by the brick. That's great. But we got a sample, and we didn't expect this, which is later. It's from the 1500, 1700. How this can happen? Because if we look at where we collected the sample, this is the wrong sample, let's say, is this white um, piece of mortar there before collection. And this is another one with the gave good result, is this one. The two samples are very close to each other because sample six is here, whereas this one in this image is here. Just a difference of one brick layer. That's it. How is it possible? I mean, is it what did you do something wrong in here? What would you do? When we looked at the results and we found out it's something wrong, we went back to the images we've taken. And then we realized, look, but this border here, it's a bit raised compared to the rest of the mortar. So it's possible that this is actually the remain of a render that was put on the facade later uh, between the 1500 and 1700. And we know that at the time the building were actually rendered, and we know that some work had been done on this building at the time. So we made the mistake of taking the wrong sample. So even if we were experienced, uh, more than 10 years um, in with archaeology and etc., we did this mistake. Now the thing is, and this is actually the point, before taking any results from the AMS laboratory and sending them to the archaeologists for putting this result within the archaeological framework, we need to produce a critical analysis of the results. It's a very simple, very simple action. It's very simple. It can be done by an archaeologist, someone who knows the technique. It doesn't need to be done at the laboratory level. But this stage is extremely, extremely important in order to provide archaeologists with the right uh, chronological information. That's why, this is my conclusion, that's why it's really important having two levels of uh, verification, validation in the carbon dating online mortar. One can be done at laboratory level using the technique that uh, the group from, uh, from Finland developed. But the other one must be done in the archaeological site where the results of the radiocarbon dating are evaluated. And if there's something wrong, this is something that should be investigated further. Only at this point, we actually release the data, release the, the chronological information for introducing this in the historical and archaeological uh, research. That's the end of my talk. I understand it's a very simple concept. The thing is, I fight with this every month, every week. I receive samples. You laughing? I can do it. You too? I receive sample, and people pretend from me to give the results as they come up from the laboratory. It's impossible. We need to have two-stage validation. Otherwise, we keep making mistakes. Thank you for your attention.